Hello, and welcome to the Drexel Immersion Graduate Scholars Conference 2019. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. On behalf of the Graduate Student Association, we're very excited to showcase graduate research conducted here at Drexel over the course of the next two days. Before we begin, I would like to invite the president of the Graduate Student Association, Alexandra Wilco, to speak a few words of welcome. Good evening. I'd like to welcome you to the annual Drexel Emerging Graduate Scholars Conference. On behalf of the Graduate Student Association, we look to this year's conference as a means to bring together the Drexel community to showcase the impactful and meaningful graduate research occurring here. The student researchers here today may emphasize with the character Sisyphus from Camus, The Myth of Sisyphus, whom is condemned to push a boulder up the mountain for all eternity only to have it roll down each time he reaches the summit. Despite the numerous failures that come with the act of research, we must also remember that our few successes have far-reaching implications on our society. Some of these applications may be a mystery for now, but every research contribution will one day touch someone's life. This is an enormous ethical responsibility that is placed on our shoulders. With this in mind, I'd like to announce the theme of this year's conference, Impact, Research for Global Change, a theme inspired by the United Nations Global Issues Overview. The UN acknowledges these challenges transcend country borders and cannot be resolved through one country acting alone. Some of the challenges included in our conference are healthy living, technology and society, disease, mental health, climate change, food, and poverty. Throughout this conference, you will learn how students at Drexel University are contributing to the next generation of solar cells, educational methods, preventative medicine, artificial intelligence, vaccines, batteries, and much, much more. We have students presenting from across the university, from psychology and engineering to media arts and design. Now, before we get started with the conference, I'd like to first acknowledge our graduate our conference partners, the Graduate College, the Office of Research, and the Alumni Association. Additionally, I'd like to thank all of the students, faculty, staff, advisors, and alumni that have made today and tomorrow possible. Now with that, I'd like to welcome Michael Cimarelli to introduce our keynote speaker for this evening. Thank you, Alex, for the introduction. Uh, I'm here today to introduce you all to our keynote speaker for this year's Drexel Emerging Graduate Scholars Conference, uh, Dr. Sarah Brenner, MD, MPH. Uh, Dr. Brenner is a preventative medicine and public health physician, and she's a tenured faculty member at the SUNY Polytechnic Institute Colleges of Nanoscale Science and Engineering, where she's an associate professor of nanobioscience and the Assistant Vice President for Nano Health Initiatives. She is currently working in Washington, D.C., serving as a Senior Policy Advisor in the White House, Off Office of Science and Technology Policy with a broad portfolio in biomedical science, technology, and human health. Dr. Brenner's work is the epitome of our mission, of our mission statement this year, and we are honored to have her speak. So without further ado, here's Dr. Brenner. This is always the, the first test. Excellent. Now, do I end this show and go to the next one? Yeah. yeah. Okay. No worries. Double click this one. We're on it. Okay, very good. Action. If I work in technology, I should be able to figure that part out. But we were joking ahead of time that you know you've always got to have a few technology glitches when you're going to talk about technology. Uh, 
So thank you so much for inviting me to come here. I have to admit, I've really been looking forward to, to coming. I've been looking forward to meeting the folks that I've been talking to for many weeks and months. Um, what, you're put, what you put together here is great. I love that graduate students have a venue like this, um, have the opportunity to practice skills and uh, think about the future, think about how you're going to make an impact in the world. I also haven't had an opportunity for quite a while to spend like just focused effort on students because I've been doing so much in Washington. Um, and we do engage colleges and universities and students, but this is really special. Um, so this is the future of what's gonna happen with science and that's all of you. So um, this is gonna be a conversation and I look forward to it continuing after the PowerPoint is over. So we'll, uh, we'll talk about some things, some ideas that I have to share, and then I would love to take questions and I'd love to continue talking, um, maybe over hors d'oeuvres and whatever else is happening out there afterwards. Okay. Um, and this one has to be in our fabulous. So over the last, well, we have to talk about impact. So we're gonna start big. Um, we're not talking about like imp crater, you know, impacts, dinosaurs, extinct, that sort of thing. Um, but I've had the opportunity in the last 10 years to really do a lot of telescoping in terms of my perspective. I work in nanotechnology and I've been doing that for a decade, as was mentioned. And I've spent the last year and a quarter working in Washington on very high level federal policy at the White House. This sort of perspective is the continuum or the telescope that I'd like to talk about with you tonight and like to get you to think about. Um, that being said, I'm hoping to also discuss with you very concrete things in terms of skills that you'll be cultivating now but then transitioning as you move into the next part of your life. So that's the tangible part. So what's my toolbox that I can take away? Okay, so here we are. Impact, big, big picture stuff. And we're moving in. You might recognize this. Now we're going somewhere. Anybody recognize this one? I had tons of this. Iowa. This is you. I was later on. <laughs> so this is you guys. Okay, now we recognize it, right? And this is where my computer stopping of Drexel ended because there's probably laws against it. Um, but if you go deeper into a, a school of engineering and science, you'll find something like, well, okay, here's, here's our actual building. You'll find something like this. So this is in my lab. And we do a lot of microscopy work in my lab looking at nanomaterials and tissues. This is a hyperspectral imaging system. Anybody do hyperspectral imaging? By chance? EM, electron microscopy? Probably more EM folks. Um, okay, so we're getting smaller. Um, I had a graduate student visiting from Sweden um, a couple of years ago, and she took this really awesome picture of a butterfly laying with a grain of pollen. All right, so this is where we spend a lot of our time when we're doing a PhD or an MD or a doctoral degree, right? It's the very, very close up, very myopic, specific games, getting data, analyzing it. It's a very narrow field, right? Um, so we're gonna start going back. We're gonna start dialing it up in terms of perspective. This, I think I got from one of my, uh, one of my research associates. And we remind ourselves of this every time we don't get a grant. <laughs> <laughs> Which is all right. Um, anyways, okay, so starting with the here and now. You guys are in, in some portion of your postdoc, of your, of your degree, towards the latter end. Um, and when I think about all of the students that I've graduated out of my group, or the med students, or the residents, or the early career folks, um, who are really going somewhere, right? Like, I'm, I'm putting my money on you. When you get your degree and you graduate and you go out, these are, they're, they're big things that you're gonna do in life. And I, and I spent some time thinking about what are those building blocks that those people have, right at the top end of the bell curve, and all the folks that I've seen come through. And they tend to fall into these types of categories. So we're gonna think about these a little bit in the here and now. Um, ideas, one of the things that's so refreshing about graduate students and young people in general is that they have, are sort of like unfettered by reality, right? You have the luxury of that not being weighed down by a lot of practical stuff that, that you become accustomed to and accumulate over the course of your adult life. Uh, young people tend to be open-minded, they tend to have new ideas that haven't been thought of. The other word for that is crazy. Uh, but that's great, that's great. I welcome that and I love, I love that sort of approach. And tend to be sort of idealistic. You think of things that could happen maybe in some other universe, but somebody has to think of them to make them happen. Um, one, and I'll give some examples along the way. Okay, we'll dial it back to when I was in Chicago. I did internal medicine residency in Chicago, and I spent as much time as I could in the ER, because that's where the action was. Um, so I did a lot of rotations there as opposed to on the floors of the NICUs. 
Um, so one night, maybe 2 a.m., a young person comes in. I think her friends brought her from the bar, actually. She's complaining of a worm under her skin, something crawling under her skin in her armpit. So she gets triaged straight to psych, straight to the, you know, there's, there's something wrong with her. She just needs a mental, mental check. Right? So she gets triaged straight to psych. I go in there, I start doing a complete review of systems. Because I'm the lowest man on the totem pole. I'm working 120 hours a week. I can spend 30 minutes with this person. And I start really drawing things out of her. She's been to Costa Rica. She's done that. She sounds way too, uh, she has way too much detail to have been triaged to site. So I have a med student, you know, there's weird stuff in Costa Rica. I did a, a rotation there in entomology. Why don't you go Google some things that can crawl under your skin? She's been, uh, been back to the US for about three months. So I get another crazy resident to go in, and we convince the attending that we're going to actually cut. Like, we're going in for something. And they think, there's no way, right? You guys are like the interns. You don't know what you're doing. You're crazy. We go in. We pull out. And it's not some jar that goes to pathology. A bot fly will hurt them, right? So I don't think she already been seen by multiple attendings, including dermatology, right? outside of where she presented in the ER. So for several months, she'd been seen by senior physicians who had missed this, because they were used to only looking for certain things, right? So it's that brand of crazy and that brand of outside of the box. You can spend a little bit more time, go a little bit deeper, and contemplate the reality that you might be something wild. This is Evanston, Illinois, right? What's a bot fly larva doing in that ER? <laughs> you got it out. All right, now the next category, big ugly black hair abilities. Um, one of the key abilities that sets apart students that I've seen is their ability to communicate. That sounds so like, man, no, this is, this is the real deal. The ability to communicate what you're doing at a scientific level to your colleagues, to your parents, to your neighbors, to people who have no idea what you're doing, this is absolutely critical. Technical writing, writing programs, writing papers, yes, you're probably practicing those skills. Communicating as if you're doing an interview with nature, as if you're talking to your local media or news outlet about what your great idea in science is or what you're discovering because of all this really myopic work you're doing, that's a different skill set. And that is a very distinguishing skill set between the people who are quite successful in research and people who change the world with their research. So I would encourage you, and I know you're doing it here at this conference, to take every opportunity you have to practice those types of communication skills. Um, the other thing that's increasingly important, given the rapid pace of exchange of information that the internet really has enabled, is the way, the speed with which and the way in which people consume and integrate information in real time. And we're talking information from everywhere. Uh, when I was in med school, we memorized index cards, right, of, of pharmacological products. And now everybody uses apps and devices to do that. So increasingly, um, telecommunications is changing the way that we do business. So that's a skill set in and of itself. You might have grown up with a, an iPad in your uh, crib, like the eBay or the E-Trade baby who was training staff. Um, but it's a very real skill set. It's a very real one. Um, obviously, intellectual and cognitive abilities, and that's basically your intellectual horsepower is very important, um, and the ability to adapt rapidly. So one of the things I've seen in semiconductor technology is a very, very quick pace of innovation. Um, and so this ability to keep up with moving targets of science is as important as ever, perhaps more important than ever. Um, in my own research group, the integration, acquisition, and development of new knowledge is a theme that we try to play out across the whole spectrum from nanotoxicology to workplace best practices. So a brief example of that. In my lab we do, or in my work area, I guess it's beyond the lab, but in our actual facility, our semiconductor fabrication facility, we do occupational exposure assessment. That's a scientific discipline in and of itself. We also do what's considered toxicology or nanotoxicology. That's typically a different discipline housed in a different building, right? Um, and in between the two, at the very bleeding edge of where those disciplines run out of tools and toys, there is a need for development of methods and a development of hardware, a development of software, a development of tools that will allow you not just to you know, incrementally be in a specific discipline, but bring different disciplines together and develop new tools and technologies that are needed to make major leaps in the field. So you can stick in whatever discipline you want here, but the concept is this can 
convergence of disparate disciplines and developing tools that can be used and actualized in real time is where I think major breakthroughs can happen. So we do a lot of imaging methodological uh, methodological development for imaging at the nanoscale in various matrices, including histological samples and environmental samples. And our goal is to translate that science into risk assessment um, that can, again, be translated into workplace best practices and procedures for people. At the end of the day, although I run a, a scientific research laboratory, I took the Hippocratic Code. I want to see my work translated into actionable, real-time uh, use cases for people to protect um, their health and well-being. This is another picture of us in the fabs. Has anybody worked in a semiconductor fab? Yeah, so I know some material science folks. You know the bunny suit, right? <laughs> and the yellow. Uh, so this is some of the equipment that we have. This is actually in the subfab. This is in wastewater treatment. So we work with workers in terms of occupational exposure across that entire continuum. And there aren't very many faculty um, that I know of, at least at our institution, that do a continuum approach like that. Uh, but it's something that's very valuable, I think. OK, I won't spend a lot of time on this one because, well, it kind of makes me a little nauseous. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but it's very real, OK? If you, if there's no go, there's no work, right? So hold hard cash, the infrastructure of the institution that you're at are very impactful. Where you're at matters. Um, in practice. So how many of you have written your own fellowship application? Quite a few. That's fantastic. Nobody escapes my group without doing it, and they feel like they're really tortured because of it, because not many faculty make them do it. Even if you're not successful, you're practicing. You're practicing a skill set that your survival and your career might ultimately depend on. If not, it will at least be a very big portion of your future success. So this will transition into something in the future we'll talk about later on, but practice as much as you can. Um, I was talking with some of your student leaders ahead of um, the talk here about you know, my journey, right? And one of the things, I put it in the funding category even though it's kind of a broader life thing, but along the continuum of being a student, I was constantly thinking about how do I acquire either money or opportunities or whatever to broaden my perspective. Um, so I started out in Iowa, as was mentioned. You guys might have a shot of actually identifying it on the map. If that is coming from New York, forget it. I mean, like Idaho, Ohio, Pennsylvania. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so here we are. Um, I went to Iowa State University, which is a big um, engineering school, and then I thought I'd like to get out of here for a while. Um, arranged a study abroad in Australia. I'm the only person to go. This was back before cell phones, right? So I'm like getting on a plane. Don't know where I'm going to go. Don't have anywhere to stay. Just going to go, right? So did an exchange at Sydney. Um, came back went to medical school in Iowa. Thought, you know, I'd like to do some medical ministry. Found an organization that could sponsor me to do that. Went down to Mexico. Um, then I thought, I'd like to see how things are done in Europe. By that chance, by that point, I was thinking about systems, healthcare systems, and systems in Europe are very different than America. So I went over to the Carolinas again. The first thing you think in your head is, I'd like to do it. Then you think, nobody's done it. OK, I don't care. OK, how am I going to get the money to do it, right? Who's going to have to say, yes, you can go? And then how am I going to get the money to do it? So this is what I mean by building in the thought process of how are you going to get funding to do what you want to do as you go through your educational trajectory. Um, that took me to Washington. Again, similar lot. And then um, building a research team at Sydney Polytechnic. So this is our campus up in Albany. All right, next category. Work ethic. This one is a must, and I, I'll not spend too much time on it, but it is the category which you have probably the most control over. This one is up to you, essentially. And so for all of the life variables that you cannot control, the deck of cards you were dealt at birth, et cetera, this one is in your control. And you should maximally flex your muscles here. And I don't necessarily just mean working harder. Um, I mean things like time management. We all have the same number of hours in a day. How many people are physicists or studying physics in here? Until you solve the 24 hours a day thing for everybody, we all still have 24 hours a day. <laughs> Please get working on that. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so how you divvy up that time is entirely up to you. If you can trim any fat out of your day to add efficiency or to do things that you can enjoy more than other things, then that's what you have to do. Um, really successful students are obviously quite organized. Um, and have quite a bit of self-discipline. They also have a balance in their life. And this is something that I 
would be really hypocritical if I didn't mention some preventive medicine talk. I see a lot of super, super ambitious, super eager, eager people who want to just absolutely lay on the gas pedal until they fall into the grave, right? That usually doesn't go so well, or else their grave comes really early in life. Right. So there are certain careers like medicine and residency that dictate how much time you're going to spend. And that's a whole different discussion. But the moral of the story is, if you get used to and accustomed to building in the social aspects, the personal aspects, the spiritual aspects, the emotional aspects of your life into your pathway when you're a student, that will carry over into your adult life. And so without striking that balance, there will be tremendous burnout and there will be a, a tremendous amount of just dissatisfaction with life. So that I always have to put out there because I don't think as many people say it as they should. Um, in terms of work, work ethic, just a quick funny example. How many of you are, if you don't feel comfortable answering this, you don't have to, but how many of you are within one or two generation of immigrants to the US? Right. So chances are a lot of our ancestors came over, essentially from the beginning, uh, and worked really hard to get to where, where we are. Right. So this is my great-grandfather, Schwaller. Uh, he is here. Right. He had a really tough life. This is rural Iowa. Um, during the Prohibition, worked a lot of different jobs, and even by today's standards, absolutely dirt poor, and we're talking dirt poor. They found an interesting way to make money, kind of an out amongst us, so here he is. Um, and probably never would have imagined that within a couple generations of abject poverty would have a great-granddaughter who went through 30 years, 30 plus years of education, right, and is now sitting in Washington. The point of it is, it takes multiple generations of people in a lot of cases to work really hard to get you to the point where you can continue to run that race. So run that race. All right, mentorship. This is big. How many of you consider that you have a mentor right now? Like, I've got a mentor. How many of those mentors are in science? How many have a mentor that's not in science? Wow, there's even some. Well, okay, good, so you're already on to my point. You can have and build, and it should build, layers of allies, people around you from many different walks of life and many different areas who are going to, um, to rally for you and give you advice on different aspects of your overall 360 degree life. Everybody has something to teach you, and the more the merrier. A few different um, inspirational folks in my life. This is a physician who, um, at a very critical juncture in my career, convinced me that it was okay to go into a medical specialty that was unknown to pretty much everybody else. So when I was initially in internal medicine, I diverted quickly into preventive medicine and public health. I actually heard those words spoken in the intro, which I had a hard time not applying. Um, but when I went into preventive medicine, nobody did. Nobody had heard of it, right? It took a lot of guts to stray from what was expected and stray from the straight and narrow field that all other medical students did. So this mentor was a very, um, a dear friend of mine now, and it has um, made a very huge impact at a critical juncture in my life in terms of decision making. Mentors are also friends and people that are younger than you. I've learned a lot from a lot of folks who are younger, so they're not always older. Um, this is my dad. Uh, he is older, obviously, but when he played baseball, he was a pitcher for the Oakland A's. And it's amazing how much you can learn, um, again, from people who have a completely different life story and life background from you. A lot of baseball quotes are hugely applicable to science. Um, mentors can be people that you find in other areas of interest with, like fitness, this is snowshoe racing, um, in the hospital, of course, and in federal government. So the picture I'm painting here, I can go on forever, but I won't, is that there are people from everywhere that have something to teach you. All right, so now we're going to transition from the what was the here and now, the graduate student skill set, into the how does that translate into the rest of your career? That might be the question that some of you are having as you go through the next couple of years of your study or tonight. So has anybody seen this website, Wait But Why? Oh no. Okay, it's hilarious. <laughs> if, when you need a break, you need to turn your brain off and just laugh. Just look at some of their topics, it's really funny. But it's, a, it's kind of a comical representation of perspective. Um, but in any event, it's hard to see, it's a little bright up here. But basically what this is is the outline of a life, okay? 
It can be inspiring, it can be depressing, it depends on how you want to look at it. But essentially, you've got a lot of years that you're a kid, you're in elementary school, middle school, high school, college, maybe graduate school, a big stretch of career, and then a big stretch of retirement. It's not quite 30, 30, 30, and as people are living longer, this is changing. But the moral of the story is, what made you really successful here, right, was kind of what we just talked about. Now we're going to flip it. We're going to talk about how to take that stuff and put it to good work and expand it for this big block here. It's also important to remember this is a really long stretch. You have a lot of opportunity in here to mess up, to redo, and to change direction. Um, so that's, that's another thing. This is also kind of a funny graphic that talks about the whole of life, right? So if you take a breakdown of human life and you look at, you cut out essentially half of it, which is taking care of the fact that you're a biological being, sleeping, eating, washing, exercise, logistics. You cut out your childhood and then you have like roughly a quarter left of what they call meaningful adult life. And about half of that is fun, which it should be. Then you're left with some pretty small slivers for your career. Right, so you want to, this is just, these are thought exercises in terms of thinking about where you are, where you're going, and how much time you're investing. All right, so here we go. Building blocks in the educational stovepipe. You're going, you're going hard and fast, and then you're out in the ocean. Now, we're at this phase, career and life. I don't pretend to have it all figured out. I learn new stuff every day, stuff from everybody that I meet. Everybody you meet is somebody who can teach you something. Um, but what I'll share is my perspective on some of the attributes that I have witnessed really successful people have, really impactful people have, and also people who I tend to believe are genuinely happy and fulfilled. Okay. So, the trans and there's X factors. So I would be lying to you if I didn't point out some of the X factors I thought were in there as well. All right, so ideas go turn into and evolve into what I would consider to be strategy. Okay. Having ideas is fun, it's untethered. Having a strategy is a whole different beast. Having a strategy means taking ideas and scanning the periphery continuously for windows of opportunity. You might have a great idea, but it's not the right time. The world isn't ready for it yet. You might have an idea that somebody else had a year ago or six months ago and you Right? So having ideas is great, but they're not going to go anywhere unless you're able to scan the periphery in a very sort of fast but also detailed way to figure out where your ideas fit into the grand scheme of things. Along with that goes aligning your capabilities with what the world needs now. In order to understand what the world needs now, again, you have to have that much higher level perspective than just the project you're working on or just your three specific aims and how cool they are, right? Because we don't think our ideas are cool, and we don't think our projects should be funded. Getting three review panelists or five at NSF to agree with you is damn near a miracle, but in any event, having a perspective of where those are going to align with needs is critical. Also, while well, well, I was talking about optimism and idealism, essentially, it's okay to carry that kernel of, of bright-eyed, bushy-tailedness into adult life and thinking about radically different worlds. People who have changed the world sure as heck weren't thinking, or most likely were not thinking about small incremental gains, right? They were thinking about radically different worlds. So that's a blend of optimism and pragmatism. Then the X factor in this category, some people call luck, some people call being in the right place at the right time, some people call providence or divinity. Whatever you call it, it's that factor that you can't control that hugely influences how your strategy plays out at a particular point in time. It's just something to be aware of. It's something to keep in mind as you're working on the components you can work on. And also when you're looking at others and you're thinking, how'd you do that? How'd you pull that off? One of the most common questions I get is, how, how'd you end up at the White House, right? There's a whole lot of things that I did, right? But there are a few things that I had no control over. Let's just be totally honest. And so without all of those stars aligning, you wouldn't have exhibit A, exhibit whatever it is that you're talking about. All right. When it comes to technology and the evolution of technology and how fast it's changing, I think the strategy component is illustrated here. Okay, pop quiz. How many, 
How many of you know what this is? Can I get a guess? Holograph? We need a history museum of science, sir. <laughs> so it's like, telegraph. This is state of the art communications right back in the day. Then we have some ideas. We have some strategies, we have some technologies, now we're getting somewhere, okay, rotary dial. Anybody still have rotary, rotary dial? Nobody? All right, can you text on it? Is that possible? Yeah, can't quite get away with that. Okay, now we go wireless, this is a big jump. Now we're talking integrated devices. How many of you have at least one integrated device? How about two? I refuse to carry more than two at once. Um, and then we have Smartphones, we have smart watches, and before you know it, these things are probably going to be living inside your body. Okay, that's the future of medicine talk. I'm not going to go all the way there tonight. Um, but in any event, this is a rapid progression of technology that is changing the way that people live. It's hard to argue that telecommunications and semiconductor technology haven't been hugely impactful. The implementation of strategy, timing, and those other things that were on this slide all came into play in bringing us what we're all wearing today. And it's only getting started. Case in point, your smartphone has more computing power than all of NASA had in 1969, the same year we put a man on the moon. So you could probably do that from your phone right now. No, I'm just <laughs> um, I think because I'm a physician, I can't not mention how I think this is intersecting with healthcare and how rapidly physicians are changing from what was the old days to the new days. And there are tremendous challenges for healthcare ahead. I hope that technology will um, help to solve those problems. All right, the next category I mentioned before is abilities. And this is what translates into really meaningful, impactful, bigger careers over decades. I call it prowess. It's really just mastery. And some of the skills that I've seen my colleagues in Washington um, exhibit are jaw-dropping in terms of how, I don't even call it abilities. I mean, it's just true prowess. And it falls sort of in these categories. I mentioned before communication is key for being successful at school and beyond. People who absolutely are nailing it, and I mean, they just walk into a room and they're owning it, they're, I don't know if hyperlingual is a word, I just made it up, they're hyperlingual. <laughs> they have this ability to communicate clearly, concisely, impactfully, what it would take me probably 15 pages to write, they could say in a paragraph and you walk away going, wow, right? Um, this is a skill that, that is probably one of the most ubiquitous skills. It's hard to get to the very tippy top sphere without some degree of hyperlinguality. I'm just making it up now. Um, but you see what I'm saying. These people know how to communicate. Um, they also can synthesize information really, really fast. It's almost like computing power in their brain. But the ability to take in information, volumes of information, fire hoses all at once, and quickly integrate that and then synthesize new ideas from it, amazing. Um, of course, that takes high intellectual horsepower. And the other feature that I've noticed about these hyper achievers, they have this ability to adapt and influence. So adaptation I mentioned was a great skill because a lot of you walk into any, any situation and sort of you know, absorb as much as you can. But the ability to do that and then also influence the surroundings requires a sort of continual intake and output that the earlier bullets uh, give way to. Um, and then the X factor. I don't know, maybe some people are born with it, maybe they're not. Certainly you can acquire it, you can work on it, you can practice it. I call it savvy. It's the ability to walk in and people, you have a likability and a believability and a credibility by your presence. So there's credentials that go into that, obviously. There's practice that goes into that. But there's this X factor. And um, if you spend time around people who are really impactful and influential, you'll notice that there's something you can't quite put your finger on about. You want to believe what that person is saying. I see a lot of that um, in Washington. All right, so that's where I'm at now. Those skills translate to, obviously, if you're talking to the press, if you're talking to high, you know, stakeholders who don't like you, stakeholders who do like you. You get it from every angle. You have to have those skills. Maybe you're hosting foreign dignitaries in the Rose Garden. Um, again, you have to be able to communicate. You have to have some savvy. And of course, the day-to-day -day work that we do in the executive office. This is the Eisenhower Executive Office building where OSTP is housed on White House grounds. And everybody in there um, is putting some subset of these skills to work in every minute of every day. 
Um, we'll do a brief primer on the U.S. government. Anybody remember this from like the schoolhouse rock? <laughs> All right. Um, they told me the other day there was beatboxing last year, and I'm, I'm out. I can't do it. <laughs> but I can do schoolhouse rock for five seconds. Um, anyways, okay, so here we are, legislative, executive, judicial branch. Um, the anatomy of the U.S. government, in case you've forgotten, which I had for most of my childhood, um, but have now become really fascinated with. Okay, there's the three branches. The executive branch is, is what I'm talking about here when I talk about the White House. And under that branch, like all of these entities that you're probably quite familiar with, um, Health and Human Services, where NIH lives, um, the EPA, the NSF, you name it, the DOE, DOD, NASA, like it goes on and on. All those people who typically do extramural grant funds, they're under the executive branch. So here we are, OSTP, we're one of multiple components within the executive office of the president. Um, what that means is we are like this I don't know if, I would, if it would offend any of my colleagues to say this, but I'll say it. We're like the geek squad in the White House, right? We all have electoral level degrees. We're advising on, on deep policy issues and pulling from expertise that was born and bred in scientific disciplines, right? We are the scientists on the inside. The director of our office reports directly to the president. Our chief technology officer, who helps direct the office from a leadership perspective, also reports directly to the president. So we are very close in. Um, when people say that there's no science in Washington, it's just flat out false. We're there 20, you know, almost 24-7, essentially, and it's all being fed up to the highest level. So um, some other things that we do um, is our responsibility in coordinating the activities of the science agencies. So we have a National Science and Technology Council, which coordinates subcommittees of, in various disciplines. Um, I happen to co-chair biological sciences, research business models, environmental contaminants, and a few others. Um, but that's just to say there are dis discipline-specific coordination efforts across the whole of the federal government. Um, if you're interested in learning more, I just put up our website. Um, we have you know, all the media stuff um, that broadcasts information. Um, we also have internships. So I'll, before I forget to mention it, I will take this chance to let everybody just kind of put in everybody's mind that if you're interested in policy or finding out if you like policy or not, um, exposing yourself to it essentially, there are a tremendous number of science policy internships and opportunities in Washington. Not just at OSTP, I happen to think ours is awesome and we get awesome interns, but there are a lot of opportunities. Um, okay, so we talked a little bit about funding and how important that is, makes the world go round. Now it becomes resources, okay? It becomes more than just your grant, or I need a little bit of money for this or that. Um, resources, I think of broadly. Resources means both hard and soft assets in addition to cash money. Um, the other thing about resources and where they fit into the scheme of trying to impact something or advance your agenda is that you might not be the sole ex exclusive owner of those assets, right? It might not be like, okay, I'm independently wealthy. I've got this huge bet of like bad cash, right? It might be that you're in a position, in given your scientific background, that you control a lot of resources, a lot of capital, a lot of money. You have some discretion over where it goes and how it's spent. So some people call that power. That sounds a little bit like a dirty word, but essentially, it's the ability to channel resources where you see there is need, right? So that that's an important aspect, I think of the whole resource funding conversation that at least I didn't think about when I was um, younger because it was all about how can I get five bucks to do this, right? Okay, um, where you are matters. I can talk about that forever, but I'll, I'll just keep moving. Um, and then how you spend that money or how you allocate those resources is incredibly important. Um, there might be free lunches in grad school. Anybody have free lunch around here? There's gonna be like free, free whatever works it afterwards, okay. So I, I'm pretty sure, which is awesome, um, I'm pretty sure I did not buy food for like four years in medical school, right? Because everywhere I went, I had a backpack full of Tupperware and it was free lunch for med students as far as the eye could see. This was also before there were a lot of restrictions on you know, the <coughs> private sector paying for, for, for stuff. Um, but the point is, if you, there is no such thing as free lunch. If you're eating a free lunch, it's because somebody else paid for it, right? And so as you evolve uh, into having more command and control over assets, this is 
a huge sticking point, and, and this is where a lot of the arguments around policy or around science break down. There's only so much money, and there are only so much resources to go around. So prudence is, is essentially how you're spending it, and the wisdom to know where things go and where they don't go. Every time you move a marble, that's a marble somebody else didn't have. And this, I can talk a lot more about this, but maybe we'll do it later, but this is, uh, this is where the rubber hits the road with regards to a lot of the disagreements um, in any category, science included, um, because when you take something from some place, that means somebody lost it, right? There's no clean wins. All right, um, and the thing you can't control is windfalls. I mean, maybe you're born with a silver spoon in your mouth, maybe you weren't, Maybe um, you know you won the lottery. That's us. So maybe you didn't. Maybe something catastrophic happened. That's horrible, right? So there are things beyond your control that I call windfalls having to do with resources. And I don't have a great story for it, so I just put a bridge on all things. Anyways, we can talk about that more later. You get into some dicey territory. All right, work ethic becomes what I call fortitude. Fortitude to me um, goes beyond time management, and it really becomes an exquisite engineering of your daily life. Now you guys, most, some of you are engineers anyway, so you're used to engineering. Engineering your time is important. Mastery of yourself, also the point from self-discipline is self-mastery, which, um, which is a greater sense of command over not only what you're doing, but also what you're thinking, right? We all have mental you know, thoughts that we would like to hone in one way or another for good or for bad, or time you spend thinking about this or that. Um, you have far more control over that than you think you do. It's a practice learned adapted skill. Um, all right, persistence and resilience, um, obviously important. And again, in the work life balance, theme of things, prioritizing your physical and mental health. Um, this X factor that I stuck here, I call fearlessness. So, folks that work really hard um, and are you know, also taking care of themselves will eventually get a lot of things done. The perspiration, results in reward. But what you don't see along the way a lot of times are the failures and the things that didn't work out. Um, when you see a ribbon cutting or a book signing or whatever it is, somebody crossing the finish line is like, yes, you know, and you think that was easy, right? No. What was probably happening behind the scenes was a lot of effort, a lot of hitting the wall, and a lot of failure. And so that's why I think, you know, the fortitude aspect is, is, really, what, is really what captures that sort of, um, that persistence. Um, and then it does take some fearlessness to keep getting back up, right? It takes, it takes fearlessness to say, I don't know what's going to happen next, or I failed at this before, but I'm going to keep doing it. Um, since I'm a runner, I, I have to put in a running analogy. I use these a lot. Um, this is the finish line of uh, Vermont Relay, which is a 200-mile ultramarathon relay race. So I captain this team of six women. She looks like she is loving it, right? <laughs> Hating me right now, right? Um, so she was our finisher, right? So she ran the last leg. We each ran six legs of it, and there were 36 total. Um, what you see is, you know, us finishing the race and doing really well and winning that race in our division. What you didn't see was all of the ice packs, the ibuprofen, the falling in the van. Like, you know, I mean, there's just so much that goes into it. And it's not just this day, it's months in advance. If there's any iron in it in the audience, you know what I mean. Um, there's a lot of work, a lot of pushing through, a lot of, I think I'm gonna break, or I broke myself, and now I've gotta fix myself so that I can keep going. It goes into these types of moments. Um, and there's fun too, this is at the Walt Disney World Marathon, so you know, you can have, have fun along the way and keep yourself in humor. All right, mentorship becomes what, what I call, and I've stolen this from the social scientist, social capital. Social capital meaning the breadth and depth of your network, your overall knowledge of humanity, and the experience you're having interactively with other humans um, on every level, cognitive, emotional, spiritual, all of those dynamics. Um, and the more heterogeneous those interactions are, the better. The, the X factor here I call serendipity. And that is that you don't have a whole lot of control over who all you're going to meet in your life, right? You can decide to go to this conference. You can decide to go to that city. You can decide to live in that town. You can make a lot of decisions with regard to your geography. But the people that you happen to cross paths with, um, I happen to think there's a lot of serendipity or providence or divinity in that. And those people can end up being hugely impactful, hugely influential, and change the entire course of your life. If you're not open to that in terms of having your blinders totally off 
and open to the interaction you're having with every person that you meet, you will probably miss a lot of potentially life-changing relationships and interactions. And I mean that in every sense of the word. So um, important in terms of social capital. A lot of times we think about the people that we're networking with in science for our careers. Some of the most impactful people and influential people for your career will not come from your career, right? And they'll not even come from science. So keep that in mind when you think of social capital broadly. Um, there are really too many bases for me to put up, so I just put up a few. Some of my colleagues from federal, high up in federal agencies who've been hugely impactful. This was the first talk I gave at the White House. This was under the previous administration. I was in, in back to the question of how did you get there. I mean, I can tell you a few concrete things, but then a lot was, you know, uh, up to the S factors. Um, I went out and gave a talk on my research. I was invited to do that by a federal agency who I had funding from. Um, one connection led to another, led to another, led to another. This is a sort of serendipitous connecting that happens when you put yourself out there. And when you say, I have no business talking to that person, right? Because I'm just, you know, Joe Schmo, assistant professor. But you have no idea where those conversations can go and where those doors might open. You didn't even know there, there could be a door right there you don't even know. But if you ran through the wall, maybe you can. So the point is, you just don't know. You don't know, you got to go for it. Um, all right. In the last couple seconds here, before we move into hopefully an interaction, um, I have to do a public service announcement because I'm a public health person, and I've been developing and teaching classes for the last 10 years on societal implications of technology. Right? So we think about this a lot at the White House level. I do a lot of promote and innovation, but I also work with national security and homeland security directors and those folks. So there's two sides to every coin. A lot of you are probably really focused on the innovation side right now. Gonna do it, gonna do it, gonna do it, it's gonna be great. Um, there's a lot of that, and a lot of that's good. But without thinking about what could potentially go wrong and how the wheels might come off the bus, we can get ourselves into trouble in a, in a quick way with technology, especially the pace at which technology is moving today. So I'll give you one example. Anybody remember this? So. It was supposed to be awesome, right? It was supposed to solve it. It's the magic mineral, it's gonna do everything, it's, it, it was a ubiquitous in products and building materials. Yay, right? Far from. Okay, decades, decades of people dying, decades of cleanup and remediation, we haven't seen the end of it, right? So because I work in nanotechnology and material science, materials engineering, we're, we're making a lot of new materials, and actually a lot of my research portfolio is funded by the, by the private sector to look at how these things might go wrong and how to prevent that. Um, so it's great to talk about WISBAM, but it's very important to think about where something might go off the rails. Um, the public is paying attention, by the way. So when I mentioned communicating with the public, um, people who understand science and have good command over the objective realities of science should be the people talking and translating it, because you better believe somebody else will fill that void if you don't do it. Um, has anybody read this book by chance? Michael Frank's a genius, absolute genius. Um, but in any event, um, nanobots get out and they turn the world into great goods. So science, is, there's a blurred line between what is real and what is not real in terms of science and science fiction for the public. So again, my, my call to us as scientists who are also ethical is to think about the flip side and to think about society and think about communicating reality to people who are not scientists. All right. Um, this is a sad story from Semiconductor. We won't bog us down with it, but it's just the point that um, bad things really do happen and people aren't paying attention. And believe it or not, not everyone is a benevolent actor. So there, it's our job and our responsibility as scientists to make sure that we are shepherding the hazards of what we are creating. I should have been a Frankenstein picture next, but that's essentially what, I'm, what I mean by that. All right, so here we go. We're making some progress. Future is near. We're not, there's no lot of classificating about what might happen with humans. We can talk about that more later. But essentially, um, I'll leave with one quote. If you can guess what it is, then I don't know. Drinks on me at the free bar comes to me. Um, <laughs> it's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent that survives. It is the one that is the most adaptable to change. Who said it? You got it. Right, so the world is changing quickly. These are skills and tools that you're cultivating now that you will continue to evolve and mature um, to keep up with an ever-changing world and take responsibility for it and actually be, um, 
may change in the world itself. So we started small, or we, we were talking small but in terms of our research, and then we got a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger. You know where I'm going with this, right? Really? Okay. Um, no, I don't. <laughs> I should have done that just to catch, catch your boot. And since we're here, we might as well just like keep dialing it out a little bit, right? Um, I work with the National Space Council at the White House, which is phenomenal because you get to hear your conversations about like humans living in Mars, or on, on Mars and in, and in outer space. It's like, yes, I'm like, oh, you're going to stuff like that. Um, but anyways, you know, here we are trying to affect change. And there's, I don't know what the approximation is and who knows what it is. Do you, anybody astrophysics in here? Anyways, billions, trillions of galaxies, and we're floating around on this little dust speck, right, trying to make it, trying to make it. Um, so it's been a pleasure to talk to you tonight. I believe that folks will go out and make an impact and we'll be one for the, for the good of all. Take any questions that you may have with Dr. Sarah Brenner. Yes. Uh, thanks, thanks for coming out. Uh, we have a mic for you, actually. Uh, thanks for coming out. Uh, I have a question about the. Um, could you talk more about the OSTP internship and uh, how that differs from programs like uh, NSF's uh, AAAS fellowship? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, in broad strokes, and I can give more details uh, later, so we generally take um, interns who are undergraduates from a professional school, maybe law school, et cetera, um, for one semester at a time, maybe a summer at a time, and occasionally they stay longer. So there's a competitive application process where you send your CV, you go through vetted, interviews, et cetera, and then a handful are selected in either policy or legal, um, those are kind of our two categories to work on the legal aspects of the policy. Um, there is some crossover. We're a very um, sort of legal office. We're you know, not siloed in any way. We all work together. There are over 50 or 60 of us. Um, so then the, they come in, uh, and depending on the student's background, what degree they have, or what degrees they're studying to get, they fit in with initiatives that are going on in our office at the time. And so, um, Senior policy advisors like myself will often loop in uh, interns based on their interests and based on the skills that they have that they can contribute to the work that we're doing. Um, but they're essentially treated exactly the same as any other member of the team. I mean, they have an intern badge and they have, you know, maybe shorter hours that they can be on site. But other than that, they're, they're members of the team. Um, how does that differ from other? So AAAS, we actually do take some AAAS fellows on assignment within our office. Um, we have one now, actually, who's in my sciences, which is great because we work on um, opioids, biotech, and a bunch of other priorities. Um, but uh, if you were to do a fellowship, say, in an agency, like if you went to NIH or NSF, et cetera, NASA, you would work on agency specific work. Um, so they each have a mission and they have focus areas within those missions, and you would fall within one of those to work on the programs that are directed by that agency. Um, so they'd be very research and science focused, there might be an educational component. Um, I'm not sure, it, it would just depend on uh, which particular agency you're in. But that is very different than working in the executive office. The executive office has purview over the entire science, um, science and technology enterprise, we're at large, and so our vantage point is one of the entirety of what's going on in the US, as well as how we interface with other countries. Um, and advising policy and political actions from the, for the president where science needs to inform evidence-based policy. Does that help? Any other questions? Okay. Uh, Katie? Come on, Robin. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so, so that I feel like that takes a lot. 
Yeah, um, well, you know, looking back, I can say I was incredibly naive. Um, I didn't know how dangerous the rest of the world was compared to Iowa. <laughs> so I was sort of fearless, um, not just because I was inexperienced. Um, but, uh, you know, for example, I'd be terrified if my kids did some of the things I did. But, um, uh, but the world is changing as well, you know? Um, so when I, I was hungry for knowledge, I was hungry for experiences. Um, I, I guess what sort of allowed me to do that was thinking that it could be done and, and starting essentially with my default position being I can do this as opposed to my default position being I couldn't do that or nobody's ever done that before. Um, for me, nobody's ever done it before is kind of like a little extra incentive to try to get it done. And having a blank sheet of paper is way more interesting than having like a matrix or a rubric that, rubric that somebody already printed out, right? And so maybe those are my personal preferences. And even if you're not oriented naturally with that sort of inclination, you can still take little steps and make decisions that you're going to go past the boundary or past the thought process that you had before that you didn't think, or you're going to have, you know, experiment with this or that, um, or try it out. I mean, the worst that can happen, I figured, you know, the worst that can happen is I just come home. Well, I didn't know that there were a lot of bad things that can happen. But, um, but essentially, I think, you know, it was, it was a curiosity that was driving it more than anything. It was a curiosity coupled with <clears throat> this default position of yes. I think we all have that curiosity. If you're in science, you've got, you've got that one at least going through the curiosity. Any other questions before we wrap up? Uh, actually, just on that note, yeah. given that, uh, so under the assumption that we can take science technology to be agnostic to like cultural diversity and effects of that, how important do you think that transition of you going to so many different countries and experience that local culture would affect the way that you are treating science, and especially in your position right now with uh, policy? Yeah, that's a great question. I guess, um, you know, in that, that's 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 when you know that
up with policies, agendas, um, you know, methods of doing business in America that are going to try to affect the most positive change for the, the greatest amount of people. Thank you, Dr. Brennan, for your presentation this evening. And at this point, on behalf of the Graduate Student Association, Graduate College, and the Office of Research, I would like to present an award for your thoughts and insight this evening. schedule for the conference for today and tomorrow. Okay, so uh, following our keynote address this evening, we'll have our alumni reception in the atrium. And for day two of the conference, tomorrow we'll start with the uh, poster session two, and then we'll move on to oral research presentation session one. After lunch, we'll have our three-minute thesis competition, followed by oral research presentation two. After that, we'll have our poster viewing, networking reception, and our award ceremony. You may find this year's guidebook online. Uh, for more information, please visit guidebook.com slash redeem and use the passphrase D-E-G-S-C. Now I would like to turn the stage over to Dr. Valerie Tutwiler, a Drexel alumni, to talk to you a little bit about the alumni reception, reception this evening. Okay, actually we're gonna talk about the alumni reception this evening upstairs. So, at the alumni reception. So now I would like to invite you to move on to the atrium. Thank you.